Okay, all right. As I'm the last talk of the day, I don't have only half an hour left. So, VPNs, options of VPNs. Who actually deploys VPNs in their network at present? Who wants to know about different types of VPNs? <coughs> so, the fun with VPNs is, of course, uh, the obligatory uh, XKCD uh, that is needed there is that uh, since there are so many standards, we just need another one that will fix all of the previous problems on it. So let's get a new standard in there. And as we say, we have a 15th one available. So for this talk, we need to have a look at what is a virtual private network. And as we know, virtual means not really. And I'm going to define that not really part as where we have looking at the closed network that we need to communicate with, and we need to extend that closed network from one point to another point, for whatever reason that might be. And also, it's happening over a shared network, not just any network that these closed networks need to communicate with each other. You can see it sort of as two islands that need to be communicating in some or other way with each other. So, what do we use VPNs for? We use VPNs and tunnels to play things like old L layer 2 LAN games, which is not routable. It's broadcast only. Uh, then we need to transit non-native packets, like for example, the previous talk is about IPv6 over IPv4. It's one of the ways that you can do that. Uh, the other thing is when you need to have something appear local that is not local, are you looking for something? No, it's not working. So what we will have to do is we will have to provide you with a PDF later on where you can then connect it up and all those fun and games. Uh, because it's a nice PDF that will do this sort of things, so everybody can look at it. And it's a nice portable document format. With all the fun being a portable document format, we will not go into that. It's like XML. But as we say, uh, we need to have these lands either at a layer 2 or a layer 3 appear to be local. Or if you want to, you're someplace else, you need to have that device local for whatever reason. And that's the reason why you want to connect it, either at layer 2, like you are on the physical LAN, or at layer 3, which you can route non-public IPs from one place to another place. Uh, another thing is software-defined networking. When you have fancy routing that you need to do or bypass some problems on the internet, uh, recently we had the fun with a client uh, with uh, ISP that routing over the one link that they have a cheap connectivity is breaking things to certain set of uh, networks, but if we, I route via another provider, I can get there. So I use something like SD-WAN to be able to tunnel from one place to another place and from there exit and I was able to get my work done as need be. This is an interesting one that happened, how to anonymize your connection. I've known of a person that needs to have a client that needs to do marketing. They don't want to show where they come from, so they need to originate somewhere else, and that's then where they want to anonymize their connection. You need to access firewall resources in a secure manner. That is the normal thing that we think about the VPN. You have your enterprise resources. You need to connect from somewhere else to get to those firewall resources and some or other secure manner, and that's typically where you will be doing encryption, like protect communication from one point to another. Quick terminology, site to site. Typically that means that it's an automated connection. It's not the user that do that communication to connect the two sites to each other. And we have remote access. Your remote road warriors, those are the users that will have some fiddling typically type in a username, password, or some other way to connect in. VPN connections that we are talking about, peer-to-peer, -peer, like the site-to-site, -site, there are the two that communicate with each other. Then you have a star, the up and spoke, where you have lots of places and people connecting to one place. 
Examples, head office with uh, the branches connecting and everything of the routing goes through that or your remote access concentrator for your road warriors. And the message, the more interesting one, is where you have all of these sites. Instead of going through a central point, you route them directly between each other to do all their fun and games they need to do. The type of tunnels that we want to or network in our is the L2, the bridge. And the reason why we want to do that is things like NetBIOS, NetBuoy. That was not uh, routable, it's only a broadcast uh, LAN protocol. I mentioned the broadcast LAN games. And for example, you need to DHCP on a specific network to get certain values and stuff for the service that you need to access. So that's then when you need to appear as if you are on that physical LAN. And that's the reason why you then want to bridge on a layer two the connection from one place to another. Hypervisors, when you have your fun with all your Dockers, Kubernetes, virtual machines that you have in different virtual VLANs that you need to connect, that's then when you also look at your layer two bridging to be able to tunnel from the one hypervisor to the other. You might not have the ability to do uh, 802.1Q VLANs trunking between these hypervisors, and that's then when you will be using some sort of uh, trunking or virtual private networks to be able to connect these two hypervisors with each other. Rooted layer three, typically that's what we mostly do or use when you are talking about VPNs. You go through a gateway or a router to get to your resource that you need to get to. It's preferred in most of the cases, but it's not as there's no broadcast that happens. The problem with a layer two setup is you broadcast traffic, anything that's broadcasted on that LAN also needs to go over that uh, link to the other side. And that can become quickly very uh, bandwidth intensive if you're not uh, properly defining or designing your setup. And layer two, uh, layer three routing is also able to uh, be easily netted and all sorts of sneaky access breakouts that you can do with it. <coughs> right. The built-in VPN stuff that's already in your Linux kernel, SIT. It's typically used for IPv6 over IPv4 tunnels, uh, like, yeah, IP and IP. Uh, the next one there. Uh, so it's a simple way that you have two endpoints, two networks, you have fixed uh, endpoints, IPs that you have on the both sides, but you just need to have like your private networks that you need to communicate from the one LAN to the other LAN, but you can't route that over the shared infrastructure, internet, whatever the case might be, then you use these sort of protocols for it. It's already in the Linux kernel, it's already there, you just need to configure it. Uh, the previous talk was mentioning lots of times the GRE, Generic Routing Encapsulation. Again, it's a simple way to get the connection from one place to another. I talked about the SD-WAN, that was a simple thing. I already had the breakout of the internet. I just need to route it elsewhere. I did not need to do the encryption on it. I just route to that distance with GRE and I was able to get to where I need to do. Tap. And TAN is the two interfaces in the, that's being used by user space. The TAP interface is the one that makes you appear as if you are on uh, the local LAN. The TAN interface is one that's being used for your routing layer three fun and games. <coughs> when it gets to VPNs and tunnels and stuff, never ever forget them faithful SSH. Who doesn't know about its local remote port forwarding? Who knows about the new jump post option? Who knows about the netcat mode? Who knows about its local tunnel mode? So in essence, SSH is there and it's one of those things that is typically used on a bastion host, a jump post, to get into resources. 
and you can't get to the resources behind it. So then you use your local and your SOX proxies to be able to get onto the jump post and then from your local machine you can connect to the web server on that side without having to go through the front end to test the back end services and stuff. With the minus capital J proxy jump, you can then do where you had to typically had to do several steps and each one have a remote forward or a local port forwarding option. You now have the single minus J that goes a single jump to the remote host and set those up for you. Very nice to use, never forget SSH. It's also nice to get out of uh, networks. If they allow you to get SSH out, use it. The only warning with SSH on tunneling is if you try to do most of your tunnel stuff on SSH, remember if you try to do that layer three tunneling, uh, TCP is not the best one to do for your tunneling for the simple reason that if there's any lossy links that you're talking about, the TCP retransmits uh, will then be actually getting worse because the SSH will be retransmitting on the TCP IP tunnel, but the connection that you are doing will also be retransmitting its TCP IP and you'll get double retransmits actually and so the bandwidth gets wasted. Ghosts of VPN present, it was mentioned in the previous talk about PPTP. It's still there, it's still being used, it's not the most secure one, but like L2TP, it's nice to get those connections, make those Microsoft type, or actually the Macs also, do their tunneling, it works, and will always be there, so that's why the reason why they do it over IPsec. Yeah, so that's, again, that's the reason why you lately do it on top of or inside IPsec so that you can get past the security of the PPTP. And then, because of all this, as I mentioned, IPsec, we have the security by committee protocol. Everything being done there and instead of having a new protocol, we have 14 independent chapters to handle each and every possible case that you are thinking of. IPsec first was defined in 1995, although it was already way back in before that being talked about and started to get uh, what's the word to use, um, clarified and sorted out. And they tried to <laughs> standardize it. The standard that we actually use today is, was defined in 2005, which is also another 15 odd years ago. There has been lots of changes coming from the original IPv6, uh, IPsec. IPsec and IPv6 was quite close, so that's why I also I use that tongue twister, uh, where in initially the IPsec was using a different protocol like GRE and also had all the NAT problems on it. The newer versions, later uh, standards, make use of UDP to be able to do NAT tra traversal and stuff. So, it's a standard to interoperate. You can interoperate with just about any other enterprise vendor out there, and it does work. As I said, supported by all, and open source Linux PSD implementations are available. Except when you're doing your own app, you don't need to interoperate. Uh, I think there's one big VPN provider that had problems with uh, connecting with another uh, vendor for the simple reason they want to you to use their app to be able to use their VPN anonymizing service. The name ends with VPN. Um, and lots of people use them for all sorts of uh, cat videos. <coughs> and see them alone. Uh, the fun of IPv6 is it consists of two phases. The first phase is where it actually does its authentication phase. It's not just 
setting up the encryption and everything in that phase, it's just I authenticate with one to the other. It's the part that's being used to distinguish between, and this phase can be used either in a site-to-site -site or in a, a remote access phase where you have the user authenticate, type in his user password, X auth and all those fun things to be able to authenticate that is the user, the road warrior. Or if you have site to site, you can have all sorts of fun with your CA keys and stuff that you install on that. So that just authenticates the two points with each other. The next phase is where it has the IKE security associations, where you map the IP addresses on the one side that will talk to the IP addresses on the other side. The fun with that is you can have each of those different security associations can have different uh, encryption and uh, authentication, what is it, Mac layer uh, hashes on it. So you can have the one set very high security and the other bulk transfer lower security, depends on what you need to do or what you want to do. Again, security by uh, committee. The three open, or the three swans, as you can call it there, the first one that was initially there was free swan. <coughs> Oh, freeze one, not really used anymore. It appears to have been taken over by both uh, Open Swan and Strong Swan. <coughs> so if you do want to implement, look at the Open Swan, look at the Strong Swan for the options for your IP sec deployments and stuff. The advice I can give you on using IPsec is firstly, if you do anything L2 on the link layer, where you want to appear on the local LAN, use GRE, IPI, or L2TP. Actually, not IPI, but you need the, it actually should have been PPTP. And then you use that inside the IPsec. And that is if you look at how Cisco and MacOS do their security, it's L2TP inside IPsec. It appears to be complex and daunting at first, especially because you are talking about the phase one, the phase two that you need to differentiate between. But definitely it's not worse than most of your cloud computing's complexity. Uh, even being supported by Azure, AWS and Google Cloud Computing, platform. So it's definitely not that uh, complex to operate. The next one that's available is uh, OpenVPN. It's quite established, full-featured, cross-platform, and various app choices that you have there. And obviously I made a spelling mistake there. It's just not supported on enterprise-type firewalls, unfortunately. Uh, even uh, it was pointed to another provider in a previous talk, they don't even support the UDP version of it, they only support the TCP version on it because they prefer the IPsec LTTP functionality. The nicest thing about OpenVPN, you have various authorization options, mechanisms, you have even uh, 2FA Google authentication support which I've recently implemented for a client for their road warriors to authenticate. It might be some of a pain to restart, but it is available, it is there. It supports both site-to-site -site and remote users. It has L2 and uh, layer two and layer three options. In other words, you can appear as if you're on the local LAN, DHCP, even your road warriors, all of them on the same DHCP from your Microsoft server if you want like that. Whichever case you want, it's there, it just works. Or you use the layer three uh, tunnel mode if you do not need to do those DHCP fun and games. It makes use of the TAN and TAP interfaces, the TAP for the layer two and the TAN for the layer three interfaces. It supports both TCP and UDP, and the TCP can even be used over HTTP, HTTPS to get through from firewalls, that is when you are behind a limited firewall. It has nice scripts and configs that you can do as the interfaces go up and down. Uh, the only problem is if you need both TCP and UDP, you need to fire up two times demons. 
The newest kit on the block, WireGuard. I'm not going to give any comments on the um, web page. They make their claims there. Um, my challenges on it, it's not yet the version one. It's layer two only. So you need to do the same as you do with IPsec to get L2 methods. It's UDP only. It appears to be a simple side-to-side -side design. It's not having all the other roaming. It has roaming capabilities for your road warriors, but it does not have all the other functionality for user authentication and stuff that you might want. And no AES support. Companies, enterprises do want their AES when they don't like uh, things named uh, elliptic curves that they don't trust yet. The one that I would advise you all to seriously consider when you have anything more than two sites to connect to each other is ThinkVPN. ThinkVPN is a simpler design than some of them. It makes use of RSA key authentication. Again, it's a site-to-site -site design that it makes use of. But it has built-in mesh indirect routing support. In other words, if you have site A connecting to B and B connecting to C, it will be able to route your traffic from A to C via B. But if A and C is able to communicate with each other, it will then make use of the A to C link to make the, to route the traffic over there. Uh, it's a very manual, unfortunately, manual setup, but it's very scriptable. As a host comes up, as a net, subnet becomes available, you can add it or decide how you want to add it on your local site or not. Uh, the only concern is at this point in time if it is that IPv6 and Libra SSL is only in the v1.1 beta. However, there's another one that if you have your road warriors, to seriously consider soft ether. Soft ether are just about any and all clients that it supports, multiple protocols that it supports. It's open source. It's a capable solution. It's not just one protocol that it uses. It has site-to-site -site and remote access concentrator. Hub and spoke mostly in its design. But it supports all the protocols, even an ICMP one to get through firewalls. Various authentication mechanisms. It has a failover support available for your stuff. The nicest thing, it has a GUI for remote user management. The only thing I will advise you is before you even try to use it, get to first learn, understand the virtual bridge and routing interfaces in Linux because you will have to set up those things. You need to understand how it functions internally because once you do that, you can do just about magic with uh, soft ether. Some screenshots on how it looks like. It is quite nice and clicky and flashy and all the colors for the enterprise. So if you need to deploy a so solution for an enterprise, this is what they will love. Colorful pictures. So in summary, and I'm just about in time, uh, Soft Ether. Seriously consider it, especially if you have the diverse road warriors and ease of user operations. You have a way to do remote uh, user, password changes, nice GUI, all the others. You have all sorts of other fun and games that you need to contend with. This is a solution package for road warriors. Again, SSH, especially when you have jump Bastion hosts, never forget that one. It's nice to get in and out of places or if you need to do proxying stuff, that uh, SOX proxy of it, great to know about for breaking out of places. GRE, it's simple, it's quick, it's interoperable, even with the Cisco's, the Mikrotex, the FortiGates, name it, it's there, it works. When you need to connect hypervisors with each other, you will have that one available. The one that I forgot to add in here is VTAN. It's also a simple uh, VPN tunnel solution. Makes use of the TANTAP interfaces. It's actually sort of, you can say, the reference design for TANTAP and also to get uh, streams, like for example, HTTP server in and out of a place. OpenVPN. 
it's battle tested. It's there, people know how to use it, it's being deployed, know about it, but don't believe that's the only hammer in your toolbox. Think, again I also, this is about the best solution, open source in my opinion, for uh, inter-rooted networks. There is one solution that I will say comes to that, but that's a proprietary solution. IPsec, if you need to interoperate with anything uh, enterprisey, do go and learn it. It's not that bad to learn. You just need to understand phase one, phase two, where they fit together. When is it the phase one problem? When is it the phase two problem? WireGuard, again, only if you can install kernel modules, it's not yet in the main line, unfortunately for them. Parting advice, think, get to know this one. Uh, Linux bridge, open vSwitch, it's the things to do for all your funny L2 stuff. Get to know them, it will save you to get out of and in and how do you switch from one place to another place? Again, the TANTAP, learn how they work, how they operate, even how to connect your TANTAP interfaces with your bridges and how they interact with each other. Don't ever forget your IP tables and the new kit on the block is your net, net filter tables, as they call it. Get to learn uh, IP root too. The IP address, IP root, IP link, you will always need to check those to check your interfaces, whether they are up or down. And TCP dump, you're going to have to see what packets comes in and where. You will need to do that. Any questions that's not in the RFC for the next uh, three minutes? I have not yet tested that, but I won't, I would believe that is the case. Yeah, as, uh, just for the sake of the recording, uh, it's mentioned there that uh, Tink also supports OSPF uh, and using that for the links that fail over over the internet to get the connectivity like that going. Any other questions? There's some URLs to remember. Uh, okay, there's a question there at the back. Okay, the first question to answer is WireGuard in the kernel modules. If I'm not mistaken, IPsec is already in the kernel. So, or needed some kernel support in there. No, IPsec is completely, well, the IKE is in the negotiation. Yeah, okay, uh, that's one of the fun parts on it is that SAA transforms is in the kernel of IPsec, but your connectivity before this happens with me. It is a five-year-old laptop, it needs another set, a third set of batteries. Um, so there is kernel support for that. If you look at your, you need to understand the complexity of each component and why you want it and why you want it not in kernel, why you want it in kernel. Put in kernel what is needed in kernel, uh, the reason why you would want some of those stuff in kernel is for the simple reason you don't have the context switches happening in and out of user space. Your TANTAP interfaces do incur, uh, what do you call it, uh, context switches from user space to kernel space. So there will be a context switch penalty that you'll pay. So you want that. So yes, WireGuard, once they're in a the kernel, will be faster in that regard. WireGuard is also faster because they do not have all the features and functionalities that you have on an OpenVPN or an IPsec. Uh, you can just as well do your GRE 
from that perspective and encapsulate it over IPsec or whatever you want to be on that case. Uh, the next question was, you said PFSense side to side with IPsec and then open VPN for your um, road warriors. It's about, you have a toolbox and you have different things for different purposes. And if we go back to that, there's places where you deploy and where you link each other together. So yes, they are good with their idea of doing that. They also provide you features in PFSense. It's actually an application that you can download and get elsewhere. Uh, we generate your uh, OpenVPN config file to be given out to users. So it's a functional solution. It works. But if you ask me for a big deployment, do check out SoftEther. It might just be easier for the admins to manage. And I thank you for your time. Go and have a lovely uh, weekend, Easter, and all those fun and games. And uh, bon voyage. <laughs>